But what we should be concerned about is being bombarded with stories where the process of labor was hijacked, where a woman's desires, where her psychological well-being, where her choices over her own body were disregarded and the potential trauma that can result from that and often does result from that. This is Raising Mama, a hilariously honest podcast dedicated to unveiling the hidden realities of motherhood. Our goal is to arm you with the information and tools you need to be your most confident and empowered self. This podcast is packed with unfiltered testimonies, diverse perspectives, and expert opinions, along with a good dose of laughter and tears. Leading you on this journey is my best friend, Megan Stander, who is a CEO passionate maternal health advocate, and mom of two daughters. Alongside me is my best friend, Chelsea Ledson, who is a mother, wife, and registered nurse with her master's specializing in women's health. Let's try to raise the next generation by raising up mamas and maybe raising a little hell. Hey, y'all. Hey, mamas. Welcome back to Raising Mama. Today on the show, we have Ivy Joeva. Ivy Joeva is a doula and fertility coach serving women and couples who desire a conscientious path on the journey of becoming parents. She provides holistic support throughout the childbearing years, including fertility coaching, holistic preparation for birth, baby proofing your relationship or marriage, postpartum recovery care, and counseling for pregnancy loss of all kinds. Bridging the gap between modern science and ancient wisdom, Ivy's trauma-informed approach embraces the mind-body connection and honors the physical, emotional, psychological, and spiritual aspects of a growing family. A graduate of UC Berkeley and the Institute for Integrative Nutrition, Ivy found her calling as a birth worker in 2009. She serves clients across the United States and abroad. You can find her at www.ivyjoeva.com or on Instagram at ivyjoeva. That's I-V-Y-J-O-E-V-A. Hey, Ivy. Hello, hello. Thank you so much for coming on to chat with us. And we have some pretty interesting topics that we're going to talk about today. It's something that I always love talking about because um, I think that preparing for birth and what's after birth uh, is so important something that I didn't do at all. So the topic of conversation today is what's missing in conventional birth preparation. And you have so much insight on that. And we're excited to chat with you about it. So first things first, I'd love just for the audience to hear a little bit about your your background and you know your expertise. I think that'll give them some insight into like why we chose this topic. Beautiful. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here with you ladies and a little shocked, Megan, that you're saying you did not prepare for birth at all. (laughs) But definitely need to hear more about that. Well, okay. I did do a natural birth class, but I, I didn't do anything else. I think that's really important what you're saying. Like that is such a powerful window into what we're going to be talking about today, because I think so many new moms who are pregnant think that that's what birth preparation is. Oh, I'm going to take this class and that's preparing. Right. For you on the other side of birth to say, I didn't prepare at all. Like that really highlights exactly what we're talking about today. That that class, people think that's preparing and that is just woefully insufficient. And I came to that realization after years in the birth room as a birth doula. I served as a birth attendant for over a decade in Los Angeles, assisting all kinds of births, home, hospital, birth center, everywhere in between, and just felt so unable to really help in that capacity Hmm. without really preparing women and couples parents preparing for birth ahead of time. And so really I came to this work by necessity because it's just such a gap in the perinatal space where we sign up for the birth education class, think we're going to be prepared, go into birth. And as a doula, I can be there and say encouraging things and hold your hand and do a double hip squeeze, but it's just not going to change the direction of how things are unfolding. 
Right. Let's just get right into it. What is missing from conventional birth prep? I am so curious right here. I'm like, so what is it? Okay, God, I thought doing the birth class was prep. So like, what are the things you're supposed to be doing or could be doing? And I unintentionally like gave that reply. I I didn't even think about the fact that I did a natural birth class. Like I completely forgot about that. And, you know, of course it was important. I'm glad I, I'm not saying don't do that, but what's missing? Why? Because I can't even quite pinpoint it. Well, I think it's so powerful what you're saying, because it's like your experience being on the other side of labor is that you weren't prepared at all. And you did exactly what we tell moms to do to prepare. You took probably, I'm guessing if it was a natural birth class, one of the better birth class that classes out there. Yeah, it was like a midwife nurse. It was a charge nurse that's also a midwife that yeah, taught that's it. that's already going to be a cut above the vast majority of birth classes in the hospitals, which are really just indoctrination programs to tell you how to be a good patient to make mm. it more convenient for the hospital. Right. These are your options on the hospital's terms. Here's what you can expect to be subjected to, essentially. I mean, I'm, I'm using pretty harsh language, but I've been in those classes. I've assisted those classes and I've seen, unfortunately, what goes on in a lot of those classes. Mm-hmm. And it just doesn't even scratch the surface of the layers of preparation that we actually need to go into this with any level of understanding of what birth is or confidence. And I say that because we're in a culture where most people, by the time they go to give birth, haven't experienced any birth other than their own birth into the world, you know, which is before they can remember. (laughs) That's true, yeah. In most cultures around the world throughout history, by the time a woman was our age, she would have been present at her siblings' births and her cousins' births and her sister's births. And right. And so we are kind of deprived of all of that. And the only input that we see is horrifying images in movies and media of women screaming, you know, being pushed down a hospital corridor on a gurney in an emergency medical kind of situation that's absolutely terrifying in most cases. Um, or the Hollywood comedy version of, you know, woman, woman's water breaks on the sidewalk and then all of a sudden labors, you know, full on and strong, which is a fraction of the cases that actually play out like that. And so I think a lot of birth preparation is an unlearning of what we've been taught to believe about birth, which is that birth is terrifying. It's a medical emergency. It's not safe you're in danger, right? All of these things are deeply seated beliefs that are not always conscious, but they're in there in our bodies in relationship to the experience of birth. And if we go into birth with this innate fear, it's going to make it that much more physically unpleasant in terms of the sensations, because what happens when we're afraid? We grip, we tighten, Mm -hmm. it's automatic. And so if we're having even microtension in the body, when a labor wave or contraction comes on, that intensifies the sensation. Whereas what we need to be doing is opening, softening, relaxing into the sensation. And this also makes labor, this is what makes labor safe. If we can actually open our bodies into the sensation, because when we're fighting against our labor, this is going to prolong labor. It can even stop right. labor and actually greatly complicate labor, which is less safe for moms and for babies. And ironically, this paves the way for a self-fulfilling prophecy, which then becomes a medical emergency. And this is exacerbated, of course, by the fact that if we are birthing in a hospital setting, as soon as we enter into those doors, if we're not displaying the kind of labor that is the cookie cutter standard that they want to see according to the bell curve, there's going to be things done to us in the form of interventions that are also known to actually complicate labor and create what we call a cascade of interventions, which often in America, you know, 30, 40% of the time, depending on where you are, result in a surgical delivery, which we know lead to more complicated outcomes um, subpar outcomes for moms and for babies. I have a question, Ivy. Um, so what I'm hearing is I feel like maybe a lot of women think that 
the education they receive from the hospital, which is just one point of view, is the education. And you're maybe saying, hey, consider alternative points of views as well. But what would you say, since you've been a part of so many births with so many moms, like what are three things that moms could actually consider like researching or doing or like educating themselves on that you feel like in general, you, you don't see them doing, but you think it could be really helpful for like the average mom to be more prepped and like more ready for birth, not just getting the hospital's point of view. Like what's three like concrete things that you think are just like, oh, if you did this, you know, it could really um, enhance your experience. That's what I want to know. Well, number one, I would say to familiarize yourself with birth, with undisturbed birth. Right. Because even many doctors today, I would go so far as to say most obstetricians today have actually never seen an undisturbed birth. All they have seen is the medicalized version of birth in hospital where there's no deviation from the quote unquote standard. What's undisturbed mean? A birth in a setting where a woman is allowed to labor on her own timeline. Ah. Where we're not doing things to induce labor. We're, al we're allowing the natural progression. It's actually a hormone secreted by the baby's lungs that goes to the mother's brain that then sends a message to the uterus to initiate the process of labor. And in many births, at least in the United States, this entire process is overridden by induction at a prescribed date. I'm seeing mothers in my practice having pressure to induce at even 39 weeks. This is even before many would consider full term, you know, 40 weeks is, um, I mean, obviously you're full term by 37 weeks um, in terms of a fully developed baby that can survive, you know, without concern for lung capacity, but we're really depriving a lot of this biological process when we initiate according to a timeline as opposed to what's going on in this woman's individual body. Okay. So, so like one witness, like an undisturbed birth, which is cool. I would have definitely not thought of that. And then what would you say? Like two other ones. Yeah. And, and just to, to expand on that, not, not just an undisturbed birth, right? We want to see oh. a variety of undisturbed oh, births. Okay. Your labor is going to be completely unique to you. And this idea that it's supposed to look a certain way, and if it doesn't happen on this timeline, there's something wrong, that is one of the biggest myths that we need to bust if we're really going into birth with a true understanding of mm. birth. Because I've been to beautiful, empowered, perfectly safe deliveries that unfolded in a matter of you know less than two hours, and I'm not even kidding. <laughs> um, and also, on the other side of that, that took course over the course of five days where mom was completely safe, baby was completely safe. It was just a different pattern of labor. Five so days? The, absolutely. <sighs> yeah, it's actually not uncommon at all. Um, if a woman is undisturbed to be allowed to, you know, because a lot of that is what we call pre-labor or mm. early labor, which is the body preparing itself for active labor. And in some moms that can look quite intense, that can feel quite intense for her, you know, depending on the way the baby's positioned, depending on um, her own structure of the anatomy. So, you know, I think it's really important to, to be willing to enter into the mystery and understanding that there's an infinite variety of ways that labor can unfold. And just because it's taking longer or just because something feels more intense doesn't necessarily mean there's something wrong. So of course, if there's a true medical problem, right? If we're monitoring baby and we know that there's something wrong, that's different. That, that would be, there are valid reasons to induce. But this idea that if you go to 39, 40 weeks, we should be inducing across the board. That's something that we're seeing a lot of complications arise from. Um, because if we look at just the chart as well, if women are allowed to, or I hate the word allowed, but if women are supported in carrying out their pregnancies until they go into, until their body initiates labor. We see that on average, a first time mom will go into labor after 40 weeks, between mm -hmm. 40 weeks and 41 and a half weeks even. And that's just the average, right? So to, to just show some of the inconsistency in the medical 
standard of care. We have standard of care in the state of Oregon, for example, being 44 weeks. Mm. Just next door in California, where I live, it's 42 weeks. It's, mm -hmm. it's the outside limit of what a woman would be supported in continuing her pregnancy into. So I think that, you know, really listening to birth stories, you know, mm. I've, I've lived overseas for the last couple of years and in everywhere I went would be a part of these birth story circles uh, where women would come together and share the stories of their birth. And there we'd be pregnant, pregnant mamas in the circles as well. And so to be able to connect on that level as people going into this initiation and hear from, you know, women who had crossed that threshold already, I think that's a really powerful thing. And not just to hear the horror stories, mm -hmm. right? Have, you know, in, in my clients, for example, who choose to deliver at home, the first thing I hear they come up against is friends that I'm sure are well-meaning that tell them their poor emergen emergency stories and how glad they were that they were in a medical mm -hmm. setting. Mm -hmm. And what we don't hear is, okay, what would that birth have looked like if they had been well-supported, if they had been truly prepared? In some cases, you know, we just don't know. Right. We won't know. But that makes a lot of sense because it opens your mind. I think it like it 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 resets like what's what's normal to you. Because a lot of what we do and the decisions that we make are just based on our the history of what we've experienced and the stories we've been told. Um like I was using an example, um, Recently in an episode, we were talking about maternity leave, for example, and the only reason why for my own, like I was the first person at my work to have a baby just because it was like mainly guys that worked there. And the only reason why I didn't like think to come up with my own workplace accommodations like for myself because I it was the boss is that like I'd never been in a workplace <laughs> where you know, even if there were pregnant women there that had babies, like I'd never witnessed it. It wasn't because I didn't believe in them. It wasn't because it was just like, I was never exposed to it. So I guess what you're saying is that exposing yourself where you haven't just naturally been exposed to this stuff can start shifting your view of what's normal. And, you know, it's a shame that this, like many other medical s stuff, I guess, if we're, if, if we're going to be calling birth medical, the, the responsibility like is basically on the mom to, to learn all this stuff because it's not like there's any real public programs or anything that are in – like we're not learning this in school. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately, yeah. And I think you make a really beautiful point. That's exactly what I'm saying. That if we're not exposed to what's possible, we don't know. We don't know what we don't know. Mm -hmm. Right. So there's this beautiful saying, um, I'm forgetting who said it now, but there's a secret in our culture. And it's not that birth is painful, it's that women are strong. Mm. And so we should not be afraid to hear stories of birth being extremely, extraordinarily challenging and mothers being well supported and resourced and able to cross that threshold, right? What, what we should be concerned about is he, being bombarded with stories where the process of labor was hijacked, where a woman's desires, where her psychological well being, where her choices over her own, the, the potential trauma that can result from that and often does result from that. Yeah. And, and before you, you know, continue on with these other two things, I wanted to also talk about what, what is the end, you know, quote unquote goal here? What if, if we do these things and I know nothing is guaranteed and, you know, I just want to preface all this talk with that. We're not trying to guarantee any kind of result, but you're you're suggesting you know doing things mindfully in order to achieve a potentially better outcome but what what is that what are we trying to do here i'm so glad you asked that question megan because i want to be absolutely clear i mean we are in a culture where just about anything we decide we're going to get criticized and fully attacked as a woman there was always something better that we should have done 
And that's not what we're trying to do here. That's not at all what we're about in this conversation. And I have assisted clients, you know, over the 15 years I've been supporting women and couples across the spectrum of labor and birth and entering into parenthood, every type of birth you can possibly imagine, hospital, home, cesarean delivery, medicated, unmedicated, every setting, every permutation thereof. And any of these possibilities can be powerful and empowering and beautiful and healing and transformational. The particulars of how things unfold is not the goal. The goal is a mother who throughout the experience, her voice is honored. She, first of all, is confident and clear in her choices and feels supported in making those choices. And in any experience in life, very often when we're looking back, we might say, oh, I might have done this differently or I might have made this choice differently. But we make the best choices we can when we're in those situations and especially mm -hmm. in an experience as in some ways unpredictable as birth. We can never say that this would have been the right decision or that would have been the right decision because we just don't know most of the time. And I think that's part of the myths that we're looking to pull back the veils around in this mm -hmm. conversation. The mm -hmm. voices that say, this is best. This is what you should do. This is how it is. That might be true some of the time, but I have seen time and time again that the person who has the most authority over what's best for her body is the woman herself. And intuition is magnified in pregnancy. You're that much more sensitive to how you feel and to what's going on in your body. And so I think that my goal in having this conversation is to really encourage people to trust themselves hmm. and to approach childbirth from the perspective of entering into a journey of being able to better and better and better trust yourself and surround yourself with people who support you in doing just that. That makes perfect sense to me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well said. I mean, I'm just thinking about like how that would, like how then post-birth, you know, how, how different you would feel if you you know, if you hmm. felt empowered like that and you felt like your voice was heard and you felt like, you know, you, you do talk a lot about trauma and I'm not, I'm not trying to say that like, if you don't do this, you will have trauma, but even micro trauma, you know what I mean? L just little, almost just like feelings of a little bit, of it, even an ick after of like an, like an ick feeling. It's like almost just your memories of it, not just your memories. It, it, it can be more of a profound effect too, like on your actual mental health. It just really depends, I think, on the person and the situation and like the severity of like how much things went against your intuition or what you wanted or or whatever. I feel like what you're saying, Megan, is the difference of you being the participant, you know, versus almost like everything's happening to you, right? Like, I feel like when you come out of a mindset where you didn't feel like you were choosing anything, you can come out feeling almost, almost, may, I think victim is strong, but like, you know, like you're the passive party, things are happening to you versus like the empowered feeling of like, oh, I chose this. And, you know, like, sure, I, I did the C-section or I did the whatever, but I like chose it versus it happening to you. I think how you approach that birth, that mindset can have huge ramifications for how you're going to process things after like, oh yeah, that was something I partook in or, ooh, that was something that happened to me. Let me just give you an example. Like, at least this is how I'm trying to process what you're saying, Ivy. Thinking back to my situation, I had... I go into it in other episodes. I gave birth in the car on the way to the hospital. But what I haven't talked about is the fact that I was like one or two days before my due date. My doctor did sweep me that day and he pressured me into it. And it was hard for me to say no, even though I'm kind of outspoken. But he just, he did it in this way where he almost kind of convinced me and I almost was like, Ugh, whatever. But I get I get this feeling of ick, like 
thinking back on it because I'm like, why did I just whatever like <laughs> my body? And look what happened. And when I when he showed up, he he didn't even make it to the birth because she came out so fast. When he showed up, the first thing he said to me was like, you're not mad at me, are you? And that was also such a weird thing to say because I'm like, why are you making this about you? <laughs> <laughs> like I'm supposed to reassure you now and I was like no no and now looking back and it wasn't like a traumatic experience for me but like I so wish I had just had that baby at home you know and like I do wonder what would have happened if he hadn't swept me and I don't know it just and that and I'm so sorry that happened and that you weren't encouraged to take a pause and really check in with yourself about does this feel right for me and I think what you're bringing up is so essential because whether it is the reason why labor was precipitous or contributed to that or not the fact remains something was done to you that you weren't given the support in really checking in with yourself it was more about his desire to do this thing and you being a cooperative, good patient, which we're taught from the time we're two to yes, ma'am, no, ma'am, be a good girl. And birth is not the time or place to be operating as that little girl. Mm -hmm. That's, that's not what we're being called into in that initiation. And not just that, but it, it's reminiscent of uh, my dating life in my early twenties, you know, where, where you're just like, eh, like, I, I, like what, I don't know what is it about me at least where it was, it's like difficult saying no to a man. My doctor was a man. Many times it can be a female provider that is operating in, you know, it is a patriarchal system. There's no denying that it is, it, it, you know, the way, and if we look at the history of birth being taken into the hospitals, birth was in the hands of midwives for thousands and thousands of years. There are places where birth is safer in the hospital, but the studies say very clearly that home birth and hospital birth for a healthy mom, where it is not a complicated pregnancy, the outcomes are very, very similar. And so this idea that we need to be doing things to you to make you safe, whether or not you're comfortable with it, is not a medically sound notion that is influenced by patriarchal ideology. And so you can have females that are in the role of the obstetrician that in order to get through medical school, which by the way, is the, the way it operates in the medical model of care. It's very similar to a military chain of command. Chelsea can speak to this, right? Mm -hmm. Doctor's orders, right? And so you can have a female in that role. And I, I've seen a lot of clients have kind of a false sense of safety with a female doctor who is mm. no more in many cases honoring of, you know, the right and the autonomy over your own body than a male physician would be. That's interesting. Yeah, that, that makes sense. But that's interesting. I never thought about that, the false mm -hmm. sense of security. And it can feel even more violating in some cases, because here you really trusted this person as a sister. True. And not at all the dynamic that you're in. You're in a very much dynamic of this is the authority. They are superior. They're the one in the white coat. You're practically naked for all intents and purposes. Maybe you have a flimsy robe on. <laughs> mm -hmm. and, um, you know, so there's a saying by Ida Mae Gaskin, who's a really well-known midwife who in thousands of births that she supported at her center in Tennessee, there were, I believe, no maternal deaths, which is just an, uh, it's an absolutely uh, extraordinary statistic. And she, ha she said, if a woman doesn't look like a goddess in labor, someone isn't treating her right. Mm. <laughs> and I would say also, if she doesn't feel like a goddess in labor, someone isn't treating her right. So that's kind of a good barometer. The two things that are like popping in my head, I'm so relating to what you're saying, Ivy, because yes, it's so true. Like I, I'm a nurse. I think so many nurses go into it and they're just like, I want to change the world and swim with the dolphins and the butterflies and the rainbows. And I was so that naive little like nursey nurse, you know, where I was like, I'm going to do labor and delivery and hang out with the babies. And, you know, it was just this like, what a beautiful, wonderful thing. 
And I do think there is very much a time and a place for hospitals. You know, like you said, there are like, thank God that's there too. But yeah, it is extremely limiting. Like it doesn't matter really like what you're hoping for. Like you're very much inside, you know, a very tight system. And, and for reasons I also understand, you know, like they have to meet all these regulations and it's very, it is very, very challenging to do anything outside the barometer of like exactly what is prescribed inside a hospital. You know, even if you're like, I had to write a whole like thesis, and do a whole study just to allow hot packs on the labor and delivery floor because hot packs could be, um, they wouldn't allow them because of the potential to burn people. And so like people suing us over hot, hot packs made it so that we never had hot packs. But like, you know, it's just, it's, it's a, it's a corporation. Like there's just all these things they have to abide by that when it comes to the mom, it's like, I think a mom wanting a hot pack is pretty reasonable. And as a nurse, you feel so stupid. A lot of the times, like people be like, Oh, could I have like um, a Tylenol? And I'm like, well, let me call the doctor and then it's going to go through pharmacy and then I'm going to have to prescribe it and then I have to release the orders and I'll get back to you in two hours. And they're like, what? So hospitals are nuts. You're definitely um, on a system for sure. And then the second thing I was going to say, Megan, to your point where you're like, oh, maybe it's because, you know, I'm more people pleasing. This is my nature. Like I did this in my 20s. I just so you know, like I did my whole master's on like maternal and, you know, morbidity and postpartum and, you know, did worked at labor and delivery. And, like I did all this stuff, super educated, had all the knowledge. I'm a nurse. And even me, when I was pregnant, I went to 42 weeks and it was like 40 weeks, one day, uber pressure. Like, no, we have to induce, like it's, it's too big, you know? And like, second day, third. And I was like sweating. Like every day I was late after my 40 weeks, I felt so much pressure to like induce. And like, I was told so many times, like the baby's only getting bigger. It's only going to get harder to push out. Like, I don't know what you're waiting for. Like you should induce, like it's not. And I don't know. And even I was just like, I don't, I feel like I had the knowledge. The self-doubt that creeps in. Yeah. I'm just like, oh my God, like what if, I don't know. And then luckily, exactly your point, Ivy, like I turned to my tribe, I turned to my sisters and I was like, what do you think? And she was like, dude, like your body is going to deliver the baby the way your body is going to deliver the baby. There's not some giant outward sign of something's going wrong. She's like, you even know, like you said, in California, 42 weeks is even the marker. Like you don't even need to stress. She's like, don't even stress till 42 weeks. Just, just wait. And I like waited and I had my baby like 42 weeks in like a day or something. But I don't think it's necessarily like a personal fault. You know, it's not necessarily a personality. It's just a very vulnerable time. And like you said, we, we want to do what's best. And it's very hard to be put in that decision of like, oh my God, am I making the right decision? All you want to do is make the best decision and you don't want to, you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. What if I took it, had the baby early and something went wrong, then I'd feel bad about it. What if I went late and something went wrong, then I'd feel like it was my fault too. Like, I just think that most women experience, or most people experience this when there's really tough decisions to be had and there's somebody in authority trying to give you the decision. Absolutely. And it's, it's not your fault if you're feeling caught between a rock and a hard place in that way. And I also do think it is important to recognize that the way we're conditioned as females does tie, it, it is another layer of this, this need to be accepted just to survive, right? And we see this with sexual trauma as well. You know, I have a lot of, you know, one in two women have experienced some form of sexual trauma. So I come in contact with this a lot in my practice in a very intimate way. And very often people will say, oh, why didn't you stop it? There is this freeze response that comes on when we don't feel safe. And when we're scared, when we're vulnerable, as you said, Chelsea, in pregnancy and there are cons all you have to say to a pregnant mother is your baby could be in jeopardy. 
now we are no longer feeling safe and now we are feeling pressured and now we will do anything that you tell me to do to make sure that my baby is okay. And so that, that just creates a really false reality. And so, you know, just to answer your other question about what are these three ways that we can, what was the question? How, how are we preparing? What can we do to prepare? Yeah. Three, yeah. Yeah. Like so, other than hiring an amazing doula, <laughs> which, right. you know, is also not a guarantee, but mm-hmm. yeah. What, so what do we do? You know? Well, I, I'm so glad you said that because I think this is so important because just like people think, oh, I took the birth class, check that box. Now I'm prepared. They also think, oh, well, as long as I have a quote unquote good doctor, as long as I have a supportive doctor, or as long as I have a doula, now I'm all set, right? And the reality is, as a doula, I'm a veteran doula, you know, we can go into that room and I can give it my all, but there's absolutely nothing I can do because at a certain point, this is a between you and you job. This is happening in your body. This is a connection between your mind and your body. And the physiology of birth, there is no distinction between how a woman is feeling and what her body is doing in terms of the cascade of hormones. If she is not feeling safe, the body's physiology cannot function optimally. Mm. It's, it's, it's a severe handicap. And so, you know, you can have the most wonderful doula in the world, but there is a point to where preparing fully in a holistic sense is really the only assurance we have. And I think that the paradox in this is like you said, there are no guarantees. We can also leave no stone unturned in the preparation process. And in my view of birth, it is a curriculum. It's handing you the curriculum for this next leg of the journey. And I worked with a a really incredible midwife in Bali when I was living in Indonesia who, you know, she was kind of laughing about this phenomenon of plant medicine that's going around in personal development spaces where everybody's doing ayahuasca and, you know, all these different plant medicines. And she said, if you want to have a plant medicine journey, give birth without medication. That's your plan. (laughs) Your life, every wound you've ever been through, every hurdle you've ever had to face is going to come through in your experience. And how you move through this is the, is the healing. It is the transformation. Um, and I think that's also a, a secret that we don't really think about when we think mm. of going to have a baby. True. So, you know, what are the three things that I would say that people can do? I mean, there's far more than three, but I would say if I can distill it down, that first one about just hanging out in the space of birth, becoming mm. comfortable in the territory and understanding the topography and how the infinite variety, right? There's rivers, there's mountains, there's oceans, there's waves, there's still waters, there's, you know, every, everything you can imagine that is normal and being able to be comfortable in the normalcy of that massive variety of the way labor can unfold. The second one would be going in into your own interior space, which is a journey that most of us um, are not well supported in doing. Many of us have never even ventured in there. And so there's a lot of layers to this. There is, first of all, examining your own birth into the world. And so one of the things that I guide clients through is, um, I call it the Your Birth Questionnaire that you go Mm -hmm. to your mother and your father. Um, People can even do this if their parents have transitioned and are, are no longer living, you know, you can do it in, in your psyche. You can do it in your imagination, just on a, on a spiritual level, so to speak, because we, we do in our bodies, even though we don't consciously remember anything about what happened in our birth, most of us, our bodies have recorded that deep in our limbic system. It is one of the first limbic imprints we have of life and of the experience of being in a body separate from a part, being a part of our mother's bodies. And so the level of how that affects how we relate to our bodies, how we navigate challenging experiences is absolutely massive. And oftentimes just peeling back the curtain and taking a look and hearing that story through our mother's voice 
um, can be profoundly illuminating because, Mm. you know, we do inherit a lot of our self-image and our relationship to our bodies from our mothers as well as women, you know, like up until the time we're several years old, I forgot the exact age, children don't even on, on some level psychologically understand that they're different than their mother. Yeah, like, like you, physically you, different. Yeah, mm-hmm. you, well, it's certainly up to a couple months of age. Right. But, but then even as we grow and develop, we identify ourselves by how our mothers are relating with themselves. That's, that is that initial imprint of I am. I am this. And so going into that interior space and looking at what is my relationship to sexuality? Hmm. Because if we're giving birth vaginally, whoa, baby, this is this is all going to be stimulated, right? The the vagina has to get really big in birth. There's no getting around that. We have to open fact. really big. Fact. That's a fact. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and so your vagina you know, will get really big. <laughs> yeah, if that baby is coming through, there's just there's just no bypassing that right? No amount of affirmations, no amount of nice little, um, you know, ideas we can put on top of this. And so that's what I mean by going into the interior space, really looking at what is my relationship with my body? What is the history there? Hmm. Um, You know, so many of us have been conditioned to try to make our bodies really, really small. And that's something that we're going to come up and have to face during pregnancy and experience. Right. Um, so there's, there's a lot of layers to looking at the interior space. The, the last thing I would say about that right now is our relationship to our emotions. Many of us have also been told to medicate away our emotions, not that that is bad or wrong, but to just know that our relationship to navigating these waves of energy that move through us, whether we're talking about emotions, whether we're talking about a contraction or labor wave, that is the preparation. Mm. There is no bypassing that, right? I think a lot of people think, oh, well, I don't have to do that. I'm going to get an epidural. Well, it's not very common to get an epidural before you're in labor at all. That would really only happen if it was a scheduled surgical delivery. And I think it's really important to know that if that's what we are choosing for whatever reason, whether it's medically necessary or otherwise, we still don't avoid this curriculum that we're going to be given in birth, right? I mean, some of the mothers that I've worked with that have struggled the most have had surgical deliveries and are experiencing actual physical pain on the other end of that. And this doesn't scare anyone. That's not always the case. Um, But those challenges are going to be unavoidable. And so doing this inner terrain work, I call it, is going to prepare you for that transition to this next leg of a journey as a parent. And that's just number two, by the way. Yeah. I, I, and I like, I, I don't want to move on for it yet because I'm having this like light bulb moment. And this is just my, I don't know, unfiltered thoughts right now. So but like, let's hear it. So like I've had a challenging last year and, um, you know, I, separated from my husband. I moved into a new house. I left my job. It's like everything in my life changed, everything. And so lots of big emotions naturally come up. And part of healing has been losing like this resistance that I have to these negative feelings. And I, um, which, you know, it wasn't, wasn't like a brand new concept for me or anything, but I think that our, knee-jerk reaction to discomfort is always resistance. Um, it starts at, you know, ripping your Band-Aid off when you're little. And, you know, that's like the first, and I only bring that up because yesterday my daughter had a Band-Aid and she was realizing it was going to be difficult to peel off and that it was going to hurt. And I was like, huh, this is like her first real experience with like, self like deciding on your own that you're going to do something that hurts but you know that you need to do it and so I was like trying to kind of rationalize this to a four-year-old and and I remembered very clearly from my childhood as well that whole just rip the 
rip the band-aid. And that's where the whole metaphor like comes from. But anyways, I digress. So like there's this resistance and it makes me wonder how if because of uh you know culture and the media and the patriarch just everything in our lives that we experience we see birth as this negative scary thing and that we want we just where we resist the discomfort just so so naturally and that can also lead us to make some decisions about how we want that birth to happen because we're almost trying to hack our way out of it you know like oh well I'm just gonna get an epidural or and and like again I'm not saying there's anything objectively wrong with that it's it because it's all it's it's about you you can it's your body so whatever you decide you want for your body but it just it just I've got like resistance to discomfort vibes like just surrounding all of it. And it's so smart what you're saying, because it's not like that discomfort ends after birth. In fact, that is just the beginning. Motherhood is the definition of discomfort almost all day, every day. Like your life is discomfort. So the sooner that you can become, discomfort can become your friend and the sooner you can learn to not resist and have that feeling of resistance, I think the better of a, a birth experience you'll have, the better of a postpartum experience you'll have. And I, in my, you know, but, but, you know, but it, 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 for me, it just happened in time. But when you, at the very beginning of this, when you asked me, could you have prepared more? For me, I was really referring to the like going in part of it. Yeah. And I think it's, it's really important to just highlight what you're saying. Cause I can almost hear people taking this and judging themselves, which is something we do so often as women that an epidural can be absolutely the right choice. And actually support the labor and support someone feeling really empowered in their birth and be a part of a beautiful, safe delivery. So I just want to state that very clearly, just kind of extract that out. Um, It's a tool. Yeah. It is a tool. And it is also not a panacea, right? Because we get the epidural does not mean we're not going to be in pain because Mm -hmm. what people often don't realize is very often that will slow things down. Not always, but certainly if administered too early, then if we're needing to augment the labor with Pitocin, which is um, a medication that helps stimulate, can help stimulate contractions. And there, there is a cascade of interventions that can result from that. Um, but the other part with an epidural is that a lot of people don't know is that there are side effects that can be extremely unpleasant in some cases. Some people can be allergic to it. Some people, you know, can they can get very itchy. They can, it can actually not even work on one side of the body. Like it's, it's just, we can't, just like we can't say the doula is going to save me or the doctor is going to save me. The drugs are not either. And I hate, I hate to say that because I wish there were something that we could just say, this is going to, this is going to save us. Right. But the beauty of it is that in birth, we don't need saving. Mm -hmm. And so that is, that is really the other part that I want to highlight here, which is that we don't want to approach this as just, okay, I'm going to get rid of my negative views of birth and I'm going to expel the fear of birth and just accept that this is going to be uncomfortable. Because if we stop there, oh boy, that does not sound great. (laughs) Not a single part of me wants to sign up for that, right? (laughs) Right? True. We we need to actually go deeper with it as an opportunity to merge with my strength, as an opportunity to meet myself, as an opportunity to embrace this sacred rite of passage from maiden to mother. And if you already are a mother, you know you are born anew every time you have another child. Um, and you know the, the other part of the epidural is during the, the pushing part, what a lot of people don't know is that they will necessarily turn that down so that you can feel what you need to do to push. And what a lot of people don't know is that nature has a chemical cocktail if we are unmedicated 
that comes in and actually are powerful opiates. Beta endorphins are powerful painkillers and our body produces them in response and in proportion to physical intensity, AKA pain. This is why if you're, you know, anyone who's been a runner knows you can run and run and run and feel like you're hitting the wall. They say in the running world where you're just gonna, you can't go anymore. It's very uncomfortable. And then all of a sudden you feel like you're flying. You get that runner's high and you could run forever, right? That's the power of beta endorphins and oxytocin, which is another, this is the labor hormone. It's the love hormone. It's the, the chemical that our bodies release during orgasm. This is actually the same chemical that causes the uterus to contract to make labor happen. So we have powerful, powerful chemicals on our side that our bodies are making without any medical intervention whatsoever. But what blunts these chemicals and prevents them from being released is number one, the synthetic version of oxytocin, which is Pitocin. For every drop of Pitocin, your body will stop producing oxytocin for quite a while. Um, and then of course, if we're having narcotics or any kind of pain medication being administered, that blunts our sensation. And so our bodies won't produce those beta endorphins that are designed to assist us during pushing, which is also a very intense sensation. And so if we're having an epidural during pushing, not only is it gonna be more difficult in many cases to feel what we're doing, but we're not gonna have the assistance of our body's um, pain killing chemicals. So again, this isn't to scare anyone. This isn't to make one thing wrong or you know one thing right. I've seen and attended and supported many births with the assistance of an epidural where pushing was, um, happened very smoothly and that the mom was able to feel enough to connect with her pelvic floor. And in other cases, unfortunately, if she's completely numb and can't feel her legs, which does happen in many circumstances, there are situations where I've seen people actually impact nerves where they weren't able to walk afterwards. So this is not to be scary. It's just to, to have informed consent. Mm -hmm. which is like something that is really missing in the practice of obstetrics as we see it in the modern day and very much missing from childbirth education is understanding the risks, the benefits, the alternatives, and your choice and your right to choice in any intervention, whether it's pain medication, whether it's induction, um, anywhere across that spectrum. Out of all the ladies you've seen give birth, I was yeah. dead silent during my delivery. Where P is that weird? <laughs> I really wanted to ask you that. It's totally normal. You know, I, I used to work in Santa Monica a lot um, in Los Angeles. For those that know, Santa Monica is about a mile away from the Santa Monica Pier. And I used to, my mom's, and I always used to joke when we were delivering at UCLA, which is like right near us. Santa, UCLA Santa Monica is very close to the pier. We used to joke like, you know, they can hear you on the pier, like the way, you know, the, <laughs> the labor sounds are coming through. So that's totally normal. It is normal to be silent as a mouse. And um, I actually have a funny story of a mom that I assisted as a, um, I was basically the backup doula. So this was not a client who had signed with me. This was a doula who you know, I was eating brunch on a Saturday and I got a call from my doula partner who said, I need you to go to Silver Lake and, and be at this birth. And I, sh I said, okay. And, you know, so I made my way there and I show up and the mother was in her bathtub, silent as a mouse, super relaxed. Um, so I thought, oh boy, you know, this is a first time mom. She's 36. It's going to be a while. <laughs> you know, I didn't, I didn't even think we were in active labor yet because I didn't know this woman. Mm -hmm. Right. And this brings up this, this point about like knowing yourself, being familiar with your internal terrain. And as a birth attendant, I really need to get to know someone to understand how they're expressing, to kind of understand how their labor is unfolding in any given moment. So I show up and I'm thinking we've got a while to go. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, I'm hearing pushing grunts that were just like this, oh, oh, like she barely made a sound. Then, so basically when I showed up, she was in transition, which is the most intense part of labor. But I didn't know the way she was navigating that inside herself was to go super internal and just super deep and just breathing inside herself. 
And so um, this had been a birth that was planned to be at a birth center, a nearby birth center. And so I called the midwives and I was like, she's pushing. They were not happy with me at all. And they're thinking like, what is your problem? Like they knew I wasn't a new doula, but I just had no way of knowing because she was, you know, so that can be actually a really beautiful and powerful way to Mm -hmm. navigate labor. That's it. That's, that's, I, I get it. I get it. I get it. That's I, I'm loud. I was loud. (laughs) No shame. (laughs) Yeah. But yeah, a beautiful and powerful way too. Okay. So let's. I, Should we do number three? Yeah, actually, I thought I, I thought your um, your you two, pros cons risk benefits was number three, but let's do number three. I want to hear it. Informed consent is like in a league of its own. Informed consent is a legal right, right? So right. we just need our legal rights. So that's important, and it's also important to know that it's a legal right that is woefully uh, ignored in medical settings it, and in some midwifery settings as well. Yeah. Um, so that's really important to know that when somebody rocks in and says something like, okay, I need to break your water now, that is not informed consent. That is not informed consent. So we need to know what it is and we need to know what it's not. Um, and the, the thing to know about informed consent is that no is always an option. No is not always an option. And so, you know, I like to have um, my clients, if they're in a hospital setting, ask what I call the magic question which is, is this a medical emergency now? Is this a medical emergency now? And if the answer is no, and I guarantee you the answer will be no, because if the answer is yes, it's gonna look very different. There's gonna be alarms sounding, there's gonna be a flood of people entering the room. You're not gonna be having a conversation in a hospital in a medical emergency. Right, Chelsea? Back me up here. It's very true. It's very true because people get stressed out in the hospitals all the time because hospitals have like dings for literally everything. And when you're a nurse, we get like fatigued by all the sounds. Like we're like, oh, it's fine, you know. But when you're a new patient, you're like, oh my God, that thing dinged, you know. And I always tell people, I'm like, you don't have to worry about these alarms going off until like multiple people come in the room all at once. Like when multiple people are coming in the room all at once and they're all just kind of like, focusing in on something very intently, like that probably means like something is not going in the direction that you want it to go. Not always, but definitely uh, it's, it's yeah. When we know like something's really bad going on, everyone shows up, everybody's ready to go. And it's like, it's way more of a focused environment. It's not like, if someone is saying, I need to do this, I need to do that. And that's not happening. That's the time for the magic question where you get to say, is this a medical emergency now? Yeah. And the answer will be no. And then your response gets to be, okay, then we'd like to have some time. We'd like to have some time to think about it Um, because it's your labor and it's your process and you deserve to have time and space for that at the very least. And, And oftentimes just taking that time can help you get clear on what feels right for you. Because when we're in that moment of pressure and we feel a level of coercion or fear, it's very easy to say yes to something that might not totally feel right. And if you take that time and take that space and just say, I want to, I want to have a minute and talk to my partner, or I want to just visit with my doula about this. That's a really good way to exercise your right to inform consent. That's great advice. Like that, that is for lack of a better word, I think a great hack, like I just deferred decision-making just to let even give yourself five minutes to like not have someone staring at you while you're making the decision. And, you know, and I think it's an empowering feeling kind of directing it back at them. Like, is this an, is this an, a, a medical or is this an emergency situation? Then they also kind of get why you need the time. Yeah. And so that kind of brings us to the third piece that I would say that is hugely important. I I'm really passionate about this is including partners in the labor experience and in the preparation, because this is a journey in many cases you're taking together. And this is the case, you know, whether, whether you are partnered, whether you're not partnered, if you're going to have somebody there, who's going to be part of your labor with you, I think it's really important to go on a journey of preparation with them and to also have them have the opportunity of looking at their unconscious beliefs that they're bringing in to the birth room because they're going to be in the field 
And when you're in labor, you're so open to everyone's nervous system in the room. And so if the closest person person to you, let's just say in the case of your partner, is feeling fear and they're confronted and they're starting to shut down or disassociate or, you know, go into overwhelm or in some cases pass out, you know, in an extreme case, that is deeply affecting of the laboring person. I think this can be a really beautiful and intimate journey between partners. And I, I think it's so important, especially for our male partners to really include the dads and really support them because throughout the course of history, you know, birth has been a female led event. It's been something that we were surrounded by sisters and, you know, a doula before it was professionalized would have been your sister or your cousin or someone very, very close to you, another woman. And it's really only been since birth was brought into hospitals that we are starting to include our male partners in the birth process. You know, back in the 50s and 60s, they weren't even allowed in the labor room. They would be in the lobby smoking a cigar and announced when their baby was all bundled up. And, and so, you know, it's been very recent, historically mm -hmm. speaking, that men are being invited into the birth room. And all of a sudden, we now expect them to be our primary source of support. And in many cases, these poor men are like deer in the headlights. And they're like, I want to do everything I can. But the male brain is wired to fix it. Right. The male brain is wired to save you. And that is just not the way this works in birth. And so that can be very confronting for a, for a dad to see the woman he loves in pain to be told by medical professionals, well, your baby's now in danger. And then he's in what psychologists call a double bind, which is also known as a between a rock and a hard place where he wants to support <laughs> the birth wishes, you know, and he of course wants to keep his beloved and his baby safe. And he's like, I don't know which way is up. And so many moms feel on some level abandoned by their male partners during this experience. And this can be hugely impactful to the postpartum period and to the relationship for years into the future. And it's not even always recognized as the source consciously, because as soon as we have a baby, what happens? Your experience oftentimes, sadly, gets swept under the rug. You have this beautiful baby. Of course, you're grateful for that. And there's not a lot of discussion to unpack what was the experience? What, how were we relating in that experience? What was going on for you? What was going on for me? And I worked with a mom who she and her partner had actually divorced and we were sitting together and she was telling me how after the baby was born, she felt so deeply betrayed by her husband at the time because he was concerned about the baby. He was like, you know, trying to do things to, he, he was concerned that something was wrong with the baby. And so she was very hurt by that and felt like it was a criticism of her, that she wasn't being a good mom and she wasn't keeping her baby safe. And when I just reflected to her, all I said was that it's, it's actually quite common for men to have a lot of anxiety in this situation too. And that that might've been how his was expressing and that it actually might have had nothing to do with his perception of her mothering. Just that, like I could see her entire experience shift in that moment. And they had this really beautiful healing around it where she was able to hold space for him in that moment, despite having felt so betrayed. Hmm. Um, and so hmm. that's, that's really what this is all about in approaching preparation for birth inclusively with the birthing parent and partners is recognizing we are on the same team and we both are going to have fears and we both are going to have challenges. And, you know, certainly it is the woman's body, the mother's body, the birthing parent's body who is going through this. And very often there can be secondary trauma from witnessing and wanting to do something, but having your hands tied. So I just think it's really important that we um, hold that support for partners as well. Yeah. I agree with that. You've given us some very insightful, helpful information and advice. And I think that our listeners will hopefully be able to take some of that 
with them into their journey and, you know, hope things can be a little bit better for them. Not that they won't be amazing, but we learned a lot here. But I did also want to want to bring up that you've got some amazing offerings on your website. I know you've got courses coming, existing stuff. And you mentioned that you have a free a free gift to the listeners today, which I thought was insane. I do indeed. Yes. I would love to offer listeners of Raising Mama. If you would like to connect with me for an Empower Your Birth complimentary call, I would love to connect with you and we can just dive into what you're desiring for your experience of your birth and clarify your best path forward to preparing which is so individual, you know, that's the other thing it is, there are standard things we can all do. But of course, the way this looks for each person is super individual. So it would be my honor to connect. And um, if you contact me through my site, wherever you are in the journey, even if you've already given birth, or if you haven't conceived yet, um, you can just put a check of what area you're most interested in. And I support women and couples throughout the childbearing year. So those who are in the process of trying to conceive, um, those who may be needing support with postpartum recovery. And one of the things I really love, what I call baby-proofing your relationship. So mm-hmm. we can do that at any stage too. Even if the baby's already born, it's never too late to baby-proof your relationship. Awesome. I love it. I came in, I have that more masculine mindset. I'm always like, give me the solution. Like, tell me what to do. And I was just asking for three things. And normally I ask at the end, like, oh, what's your worst of wisdom? But I feel like I asked for three and I have like five huge takeaways from this call, which is like, number one, you know, go listen to a bunch of different birth stories, not just the traumatic ones, not just the hospital ones. Like, I love that idea. Like the chicken noodle soup of birth stories. There's got to be that. And then number two is that, that'll be our bestseller. <laughs> probably. Number two, introspect, because a lot of shit's gonna come up. And so if you're not doing the introspection now, or you're just thinking you can rip the band-aid off or avoid it at some point, delivery, postpartum, it's gonna come up. So doing that introspective work is so helpful. Number three, the consent. I love that. Knowing the pros, the cons, you know, the alternatives, really great. Number four, what I really got out of this was basically like your partner, you know, like one, give them some grace, but like learn how to include them, which I think is pretty awesome. And then I feel like the last major thing that I was kind of learning from you today was just that like, man, there's this like whole world out there, you know, like to keep your mind open and that there's a million ways to have a really smooth and good delivery and It's just the start to this awesome motherhood journey. And you're like chock full of like, just, I don't know. Those are never things I would have thought about myself. So I'm just really pleased that I learned so much and we got to have you on this cool episode. And thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks, Ivy, so much. And also to our listeners, we did collaborate with Ivy on an empowered birth plan template. She reviewed it and gave her nod of approval after some adjustments. Um, And it's got her info in there too. It'll help you gain confidence on in your birth journey. If you're, if you're pregnant, Um, enhance communication with your healthcare providers. So check it out. It's free. It's on raisingmama.com. And thank you so much. Thanks for being on the show. It's a medical emergency. Is it a medical emergency now? Is it a medical emergency? Such an honor, lady. Bye. Bye. Thank you for tuning in to the Raising Mama podcast. Your presence means a lot, and we hope you found our discussion insightful. Become a part of our community. Follow us on Instagram at Raising Mama Podcast. Explore resources on the Raising Mama Village located at www.raisingmama.com. You're never alone on this motherhood journey. We're here to support you every step of the way.